Thank you. So thank you so much everyone for joining us today. We're really happy to be hosting this really important conversation and very timely as well. My name is Inaudi Esposito. I'm the Executive Director for the Orange County Human Rights Commission. I use the pronouns she, her, and ella. And as many of you know, the mission of the Human Rights Commission is to bring communities together and to bring education and awareness around issues affecting oppressed communities. Um, and as many of you who are on this call know, uh, COVID-19 affects oppressed communities on different levels. So we would like to make sure that with partnerships, we bring that conversation forward. Today's forum is a partnership between the Human Rights Commission and the Newburgh Healthy Black and Latinx Coalition. And to co-facilitate this conversation with me today is my colleague, Annette Marzen. Annette, would you like to introduce yourself and the coalition? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Annette Marzan. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Annette Marzan, and I'm the Senior Regional Director of Community Engagement for Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, ella. Also here with us today is Lana Williams Scott, who is the Assistant uh, Vice President of Community Engagement for Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, and Judy DiMatteo, who's our Program and Data Manager. Um, on behalf of the Newburgh Healthy Black and Latinx Coalition, I want to thank everyone for being here with us today and for supporting each other in this effort to make sure that our community has the information and the resources that, uh, that uh, we may need during these challenging times. Um, I also co-lead uh, with LANA, the Newburgh Healthy Black and Latinx Coalition that consists of nonprofits, uh, civic, private sector, faith-based and community residents. Um, it was founded in 2016 to address a wide range of uh, health disparities and social determinants of health among communities of color, and in particular, focusing on the city of Newburgh. Um, currently, there's approximately 30 members, organizations, and individuals who participate in our monthly meetings. Um, some of the activities that the coalition has collaborated on are National HIV Awareness Testing Day, a community engagement, and enhanced outreach uh, training for that we offered the coalition partners, which was uh, facilitated by Chickatelli Associates, um, a community, two community or three community ID programs, uh, forums that were held in the armory, the black maternal health film screenings, which resulted in the current formation of the uh, black maternal health mortality task force that was formed in 2019. Um, and we also had a Loretta Ross Community Brunch. Um, those are some of the projects that we have worked on together as a coalition. Um, in summary, we are a network of health human service organizations, faith-based and community members that work to improve the health and well-being of the community. Um, so that's a, a little bit of information about the Newburgh Healthy Black and Latinx Coalition. Thank you, Annette. You're awesome. Welcome. So before we hear from our amazing presenters, we just want to go over some housekeeping. Um, so the first thing is, as many of you have already noticed, we are recording the forum. Um, the purpose for that is because really our goal is to make sure that we get this information out to as many people as possible. Um, we are very appreciative of the caseworkers, the school personnel that's on the call, the different, you know, uh, I see different interfaith leaders on the call, um, but everybody who's here, because I know that you're here to learn more as to how can you help our community. So we are recording it so that once you get this link, please, please share widely. Um, with that said, for anyone um, who is somewhat new to Zoom, we prepared a little bit of a quick presentation that's on your screen right now. Everybody will be automatically muted. We ask that you please remain muted so that um, we can get through the presenters because we have five different presenters, uh, six actually that will be speaking. Um, so on the bottom left screen there, you should continue to be muted. Uh, and the next thing is that we will be moderating the chat box. So any questions that you may have at any time, doesn't matter when, please write them down in the chat box. Um, Lana will be moderating that, which means she will be just going through them and writing down the questions so that we can uh, try to get to as many as possible. We won't be able to get to all of them, um, but we will try to get to as many as possible at the end of the call. Um, and any questions that we don't get to, we will be sharing a uh, resource form, which Annette will explain um, now. Annette, if you can tell them about the resource form. Yeah, so we put together a, um, a community resource listing 
um, categorized by, you know, um, topic of food insecurity or food access, um, different topics. And that is going to be emailed to everyone after each of the forums. Um, and now, is that going to be also posted somewhere online? Yes, uh, you will get the link to the website at the end, but it will be on the human rights website. Absolutely. Right. So that'll be sent to everyone that's on here. Um, because you all had to register, we have your emails. So everyone will get a listing of those um, different uh, resources, which also has links within them to access information as well. Okay. Perfect. All right, so without further ado, our presenters, which is why we're here. Um, so our first set of presenters will be discussing some of the options on how folks in our community can access food. Um, so representing the Collectively Feeding Our Neighbors initiative is Michelle McCune from Recap and Melanie Collins from Link Community. So ladies, the floor is yours. I wanna make sure everybody can see our screen. Yes, yes, good, good. Okay, thank you, Anadi, for giving me a thumbs up. Um, so uh, Melanie Collins is also here on the call or on the Zoom meeting. I don't see her, but I wanna make sure that um, she is out there somewhere because she's going to be co-presenting. Um, and um, so the first thing we're gonna do is just kind of introduce our organizations for anybody who, who doesn't uh, know us. We're also gonna talk a little bit about what food insecurity is and some of the stats and the data around our communities. Um, and then we're gonna talk about collectively feeding our neighbors. Um, so RECAP is the state designated not-for-profit. Um, we were established in 1965 and actually um, this spring is our 55th birthday. So we're very excited that we've been able to um, serve our community for 55 years. Um, we provide comprehensive services to the community and um, as a cop uh, as a cap, we, re we respond to the fluid needs of a community, meaning we go where the gap in services are. Um, and one of the things we noticed um, on a regular basis is the issue of food insecurity. Uh, and we serve a, a comprehensive host of people, seniors, vets, children, those struggling with substance use disorder, individuals affected by domestic violence, those living with HIV and AIDS, those recently released from incarceration, and anybody who lives below the poverty line. And we do that with um, weatherization services, Head Start services, our Fresh Start cafe, uh, supportive housing, housing case management, um, and a whole host of other uh, uh, programs and services uh, to serve our community. Um, and now Melanie is going to talk a little bit about LINK. Is she muted? I can't see her at all. She was here. Melanie, can you hear us? You're probably on mute because she was here. She might be mute. Um, I don't see, is she coming She's, up as herself? Oh no, she has my name. Oh, okay. One second, let me unmute her. Oh, she's the, one, she's the one asking for, me to, for you to unmute her. Yeah. I'm actually not seeing that, oh, oh okay. Melanie, can you say something? Because I think I just did. Hi, everybody. There you are. Hi, Mel. Perfect. There I am. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a voice. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Melanie Collins from Link Community Organization, formerly Black Vanilla Community Foundation. Um, working alongside uh, Michelle. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Link is uh, we partnered with Rupco Construction and we're restoring the First United Methodist Church eventually, once we hopefully get some construction workers on site. And the focus of our work is um, establishing relationships to um, offer support in community, um, as well as um, just being a link and a hub for organizations uh, in the city of Newburgh, um, once we are open and operating out of the church, we'll be doing job skills training and uh, some workforce development, um, applying for the Youth Build Grant again. And, um, and currently uh, with Michelle and other uh, volunteers and community organizers um, working on the collectively helping our neighbors and uh, Newburgh Mutual Aid to get food out to folks here in the city of Newburgh. Uh, to date, we have delivered food to almost a thousand families and um, 
and we've delivered over 70,000 pounds of food in five weeks. So we decided because it, um, we have both um, uh, our colleagues on and um, our communities on, um, we decided just to take a look, uh, a quick look at what food insecurity is. And um, it's a disruption, of, a disruption of food intake or eating patterns, um, a bit in, a, in an inability to access food, um, and enough it, an inability to provide enough food. So certainly with the, the pandemic, there has been a disruption of food, and we wanted to make sure that we were address, uh, addressing that. Um, and then for for everyone's purposes for recording, you can take a look at it later. Um, we look at what security looks like and what we look what looks uh, what we look at as low food security, um, and that we're low food security and very low food insecurity. Security is what we've been experienced here. Um, the food insecurity is directly tied to the impact on health. So if you do not have um, uh, stable housing, stable food access, it affects your health. And if you look at the social determinants of health, um, housing and food are really high up there on the healthy communities um, checklist. Um, and we look at the causes of food insecurity, and we certainly look at um, poverty, unemployment, food apartheid, and inconsistent access to enough healthy food. And that's what we're finding locally, not just in our county, but certainly in our community as well. When we look at the poverty rate in Orange County, the county poverty rate is 11.8%. And if we look at women-headed households, women-headed households have a poverty rate of 30.2. If we drill down a little bit into the city of Newburgh, the poverty rate is almost 30%. And the women-headed household poverty rate is 52.4%. So you can see there is a lot of need in our community and the poverty rate hits women-headed households hardest. Um, so Mel, do you wanna talk about how we started having these conversations? <laughs> You're off mute. There we go. Hi. Um, yeah, so this all started um, at a ball shop, and uh, a few women got together and recognized um, in the beginning 19 that uh, elderly folks, especially, would have to stay inside and um, and would not be able to get out to uh, grocery stores. That um, that students, um, this was prior to the school district announcing their food plan, but that students and young people would be home uh, that typically would rely on school meals and they'd be home and would need to have um, groceries delivered to them because um, once they announced they didn't want people to come out, um, they would have to stay home. And so that was how the conversation started. And uh, it was a group of women over coffee that got together and said, how can we um, facilitate an effort to get food to the doorsteps of people without um, without them having to leave their homes? And, uh, and that's how it started. And I think one of the things that helped us realize that this was going to be an issue is when the tornado hit in May of 2018, um, we realized really quickly that we had a community in need. So Melanie um, on where uh, Black Vanilla is and the Black Vanilla Foundation is, um, they started feeding folks in their section of the city. Uh, recap, we were one of the only um, buildings that still had power. So we started uh, feeding folks here. We, we were open uh, around 15 hours, 16 hours a day, starting at 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, and we realized that um, charging things was important you know, for, for power. Um, and certainly food insecurity uh, was uh, really important. And it wasn't um, a systematic approach. It was a bunch of folks in the community serving the community. And I think um, that's, that's really what spurred the conversation before the shutdown is because we knew that this was going to be an issue and figured that we could help. Um, we looked at what the gaps were, and certainly the gaps were around how to get people food if they couldn't come to you. And then we looked at um, who could be our partners. So um, we partnered, uh, Link and Recap partnered with the Food Bank of the Hudson Valley, who have been unbelievably and remarkably generous, and as Melanie uh, said, uh, has given us 70,000 pounds of food. Um, we partnered with Nobody Leaves Mid Hudson to make sure that uh, we were getting to all of our community members and to make sure that um, 
those who don't have access to systematic approaches to um, accessing food were also included in the conversation. Um, Grace Community Church stepped up and um, are part of our volunteer corps. Um, and then we turned to the community um, themselves to ask them to volunteer. And I see Melanie's on mute, so I know she wants to jump in and talk about the community effort for this. So Mel, you wanna talk about the community and Teach Love? Sure, so um, we, what we've been doing is, um, is putting together boxes of food um, and volunteers have shown up to, um, in the beginning volunteers were showing up, we would load boxes into their cars and then they would go and deliver uh, to the doorsteps of folks without having to make any contact and that allowed people to be able to stay at home. Um, more recently, uh, we've had some volunteers that have uh, Shapiro's Furniture, who has a box truck, has uh, stepped up and graciously donated their truck, which allows us to put uh, over 100 boxes in the truck at one time, as well as other volunteers that have vans or um, larger um, vehicles that have a, a, the ability to hold more boxes. Um, one of the things that is really important to us is not just that we're delivering food to folks because uh, we recognize that this um, that this effort is something that's going to continue long after COVID-19 and existed long before COVID-19, food insecurity. Um, and so one of the things that we are going to move forward with uh, probably in the next delivery um, or next after that is um, is an effort that is being organized by my sister Katie Collins and it's called Teach Love and um, basically what will happen is of the uh, almost a thousand families that we have right now that we're um, delivering food to they will have the option of accepting in addition to the box a garden box and um, Kate uh, Kate will in that have instructions on how to care for what's delivered to their home and it will be something small and compact that can go in the ground if they have a yard that they can plant it in or it can sit on a deck or a porch or even inside their house in their kitchen and they'll have the option of two or three things that they can grow which will allow them to be able to have sustainable a uh, healthy option that will continue to produce food, uh, you know, whatever it is that they choose to have. And so uh, we'll start doing that in the next delivery. Uh, so a couple of things we wanted to make sure that this mutual aid did was um, reflect our community, um, that our volunteers are, are from everyone we just mentioned, but they also come from our community, um, including people who get food boxes, have also delivered, uh, offered to come and deliver boxes, and then um, using Teach Love to uh, really look at sustainability and what that looks like. Um, and then we have the conversation, um, and Melanie just mentioned it, around food insecurity, um, which is COVID-related, and community food insecurity that is not. Um, and I think at the at the end of this, which is what 2023 at this point, um, we're going to have to have a macro versus a micro conversation around food insecurity, and how do we respond as a community? Um, you know, it, it's great that you know we decided to sit around together and create this movement, um, but um, having a systematic uh, approach to serving vulnerable populations needs to be a conversation that we are all having together. Um, so when we're looking at moving forward, it's really about how do we create community, how do we create structure, um, and what are our solutions around uh, food insecurity. Uh, collectively feeding our neighbors in Newburgh Mutual Aid is one response. Um, but I think we have to look a little bit bigger than that or we will be back in this exact same position the next time this happens. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you so much, uh, ladies. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, we will have time for Q&A, but can you just please real quick plug in, how can folks get boxes? How can they go on your list? Sure, so they can call a number, 845-4000, um, 
419-8321. They leave their name, their address, their phone number, and their family size. And then we put them into our database and they uh, are then put on our delivery list. Perfect. And that number will be on the chat box shortly. So Michelle, if you don't mind plugging that in there, thank you so yes. much. Um, That's and just also, Inadi, that's yeah. also on the community resource list that we, that, we that everybody's going to get later on. I added that number in there. Okay. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you, Annette. Um, and just uh, before Annette takes the floor to present the next speaker, um, also as a reminder to the uh, listeners, whoever uh, is joined is here with us, um, that there are other resources as well. Office for the Aging is continuing to provide hot meals um, for seniors. Uh, they are delivering hundreds a week. Um, there are lots of different uh, interfaith communities and churches that are out there um, still providing uh, food uh, and there's soup kitchens and food pantries. And we actually, in the resource uh, document, have by area. So the, port, the list of Port Jervis, food pantries in Newburgh and Middletown, et cetera, that you will be able to access. In addition to, of course, um, the school districts are also still um, providing information. And that will all be found on our resource sheets. So thank you so much, Annette. OK, so next we have Angela. Angela Hens. Did I pronounce that right, Angela? You did She's perfectly. OK. Um, Angela's with the Mental Health Association um, of Orange County. And she's going to be uh, addressing mental health now with all of us. OK, so thank you for inviting me to be here to represent Mental Health Association in Orange County. We are the forefront for the Orange County Crisis Call Center. So all COVID-19 calls come through the call center. So if you've heard the county exec or different um, flyers and materials that went to your home that has the 1-800-832-1200, that is what um, comes through the Mental Health Association in Orange County. I wanted to touch on some of the other services as an agency in what we've been trying to do during this pandemic. Although our staff are considered essential and are all working, we did unfortunately close our doors to having people walk in, but through the technology and those of you that were on earlier, we kind of joked about those of us that like Zoom or the uh, FaceTime and all that kind of stuff that we've kind of gotten used to it. So as an agency, we have been following all the guidelines for social distancing and what we can and cannot do um, face to face. But um, let's see if my screen is going to cooperate. We understand that the, the circumstances definitely trigger difficult feelings such as fear and anxiety and depression. So at this point through the call center, we are probably getting over a thousand calls a week that um, I would say 75 to 80 percent are connected right now to COVID-19. A lot of them are the insecurities to food and housing and particularly unemployment with the long waits, the long um, phone. And I think you all can relate that you're waiting for somebody to pick up and they put you in a queue and somehow your cell phone um, dies and now you have to start all over. So a lot of the work through the call center is we've been creating a resource directory every day, not for the whole county, but specific to the clinical and counselors that are taking the call. So we've been able to give out obviously recap and Jewish family service and the, the office of the aging and New York connect and all the different food pantries. So we can't thank everybody enough for taking the time to support the people we serve. I also have to do a shout out for not only all the MHA staff, but all of the care managers and case managers and peers through independent living and ADAC and Catholic Charities, all the people that are still serving their individuals. For example, picking up the food, doing the drop off. So they're not coming into face to face, but they are taking the time to make sure the people that they serve that are on their caseloads are truly um, being connected. Because as everybody can only imagine, the idea of isolation and loneliness that the people we serve are feeling at this point because normally they are picked up, they are connected, they are going out in the community. Just simple things like picking up your mail or doing your laundry or going to the grocery store. So the call center is not only for information referral, but it does give individuals that do feel isolated that are struggling with their mental health an opportunity to talk to a trained clinician 24 seven. 
the call center again um, during this time has been the number and it's just the idea that hope starts here the trends that we're experiencing in addition to the uh, food insecurities or just the devices people need to be able to be home and work remotely or have their children being um, able to show that they're doing their schoolwork at the same time as they're trying to work remotely as well. So we've been strategizing um, with individuals that do call through to be able to support them with those needs as well. So anything that someone is struggling with, we may not know the answer, but we definitely would do that welcome orange um, hand up to support them with everything that they need at, at this point. I mentioned that the call center does the telephonic um, support and assessment, but just want to remind everybody that through the call center as of April 1st, 2019, we do um, assess to determine if the mobile response team, which used to be mobile mental health through access supports for living, if a mobile response um, to someone's needs needs to be dispatched. So we do that as well. We also um, carry the the it's called a prx we also um, connect our callers to a peer through independent living and a substance use peer through catholic charities and the alcohol drug abuse council of orange county so the primary focus of the orange county crisis call center is substance use mental health and development of disabilities but right now as we work through this pandemic it's for the um, individuals in our community for needs connected to covid 19. We also have our text for teens. We can't remind ourselves how important it is for our young people to be struggling with not able to see their girlfriend and boyfriends, their partners, their friends, getting back to school. I think some people are actually enjoying being at home, but I think we are go going to need to prepare ourselves as to what's gonna happen when people go back to school in September to, or the end of August to, to really truly know uh, what working from home has done to their ability to learn and to process the material that's needed for the next um, grade. What we do know with Text for Teens, we do see um, a lot of young people just texting their concerns, their state stating that mom and dad are kind of arguing more often now that they're home all the time. Um, and that's understandable that everyone's struggling, but if if you think about the mode of uh, communication for young people has always been texting. So the 845-391-1000 number, that's also available 24 seven, like the 1-800 number, 832-1200. We have the trained clinicians and counselors answering those texts. So definitely a, an important resource to give out at this, at this point. We also have the Orange County Rape Crisis through Mental Health Association in Orange County. They are continuing to provide the 24 seven advocacy services as well as our sexual assault examiner program. They're still going into Orange Regional Medical Center, Montefiore St. Louis Cornell Hospital. And I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but we do now have a contract through Keller Army Community Hospital. Our sexual assault examiners go there as well. We are still providing educational programs through um, the internet. And unfortunately with April being um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we weren't able to go out and do our typical um, marketing with the um, different things that we do in the community, but just be prepared that our goal is to continue to advocate and work with the people in our community that through sexual violence um, need support at, at this time. So we still have been going to the um, hospitals. We also have been doing this, it's pretty cool. I never knew that people did this. So this is um, showing my age, but we've been doing this Netflix series and every Friday, and because Thursday is the last day of the month, they have one as well. But what's been happening is they've been doing movie viewing, and people are able to connect through Netflix and uh, our Netflix party and be able to chat during the movie. And the movies so far have really been connected to uh, women's issues, women's rights, and some of the legislation that um, has come down over the years that really has not truly worked towards um, empowering women during uh, a most vulnerable time, uh, particularly around sexual assault. Our Vet to Vet program, um, very excited that they got funded for another year. It's one of those programs where these are individuals that are veterans themselves. They have continued to assist. They've been doing some transportation, some meal delivery, really to support our vets that either are homeless or really struggling in their homes with traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress, um, and military sexual trauma. They have a lot of virtual information that's happening. Um, warriors, writers, work group, music work groups, and support groups. 
And so these information, these um, contacts will be added to hopefully, I'm, I'm assuming the resource list as well, because they're still out there doing a great job. Our housing, um, obviously, when we talk about who's connected to someone for case management, care management, obviously our housing staff are proactively calling clients daily, navigating, negotiating, communicating with landlords and making sure that basic needs are being met, everything from water, paper towels, toilet paper, diapers, we have some programs that are working with families. And so at this point, um, we always ask people, even with the call center, are you connected somewhere? Because some of the food deliveries, we really want to save for individuals that have nobody that can connect them, but we still access those resources to actually pick up, particularly honor. We go um, daily, pick up a list of food um, baskets for the people we serve, and then deliver them throughout the day. Uh, developmental disabilities and family support. They are still um, being able to offer the access to money, autism spectrum front and the Capice programs. These are all being done through e-gift cards now for people that um, are eligible for these services. Obviously we're not giving um, hard copies of gift cards, but please um, just know if you go to MHA's website, you will be able to access um, those applications as well. Think about care management, I mentioned earlier, I can't thank them enough, the amount of work, the amount of um, information sharing that they're doing with the people they serve, the daily deliveries. They are also able to provide our people that are connected with MHA with track phones so that they have access to um, resources and they're doing daily check-ins as well. And as I mentioned earlier with the food deliveries, it's the fact that we're still not doing face-to-face, -face, but we're still doing the drop-off curbside, that kind of stuff. And if someone is eligible, we can definitely do uh, a referral and do intakes over the phone. Our child adult care food program through Hudson House. Um, obviously we're not having members come into the program, but we have individuals that um, are members of Hudson House, our psychosocial club. So they got permission through our um, federal funding, the child, <clears throat> excuse me, an adult care food program has been approved to um, develop meals and to deliver them daily. So that's been exciting as well. Some of the stuff that we would do with the members, they would get breakfast, lunch, snack, and sometimes dinner. And we've been able to continue feeding the people that normally come in daily. And as Michelle had mentioned about food insecurities, you know, taking away a resource that you could count on each day and try to put some of it back into the work that we do. Our family support program, again, um, as we get ready for May is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Unfortunately, a lot of the activities that were planned, there's usually the walk through um, Voices of United for Change, as well as there's usually an opportunity for the county to bring together all the people that work with children's services to do professional development. So those things at this point, I've been told have been canceled, but we want to give a shout out to our family support program that's gonna do a family ties. That's for um, parents with a child with mental health and there's a support group being planned for May 13th. And then family and friends together are for individuals that have an adult child with the mental health so that um, collectively we can continue to offer those support groups that we do monthly. But instead of coming into our offices, you'll be able to do it via Zoom. Our social programs, we've been doing daily calls with our social club, Comp Here, Welcome Orange Geriatric Initiatives. So if anybody has individuals that are interested to continue to um, advocate by filling out applications, getting them connected, these social programs are the ones that I think have impacted our community for MHA the most because they're used to getting together on a Monday or a Wednesday and doing those social activities, playing bingo, doing things that <clears throat> they normally wouldn't do if it wasn't coming together. So they've been doing Zoom calls, they've been doing food deliveries, they've been doing um, pen pal letters and social club newsletter. And what's been exciting with them is these are individuals that never thought they would get on via Zoom or do something over the internet. And they've actually really been enjoying it. They've been um, loving the interaction and one person said he wasn't going to join because he didn't get to talk the entire time. And so trying to re-engage people that um, how we're communicating is different, but it also opens up for down the road, like Michelle was saying, if something happens again, you know, bad weather, et cetera, you know what, we can still hold program. We can still get people together via Zoom instead of um, canceling a program because of weather, that kind of stuff. So a lot of lessons learned for um, MHA and the people that I gladly work with every single day. 
um, social media. We are posting daily. We are posting everything getting ready for uh, May is Mental Health Month. This month being Sexual Assault Awareness Month. We've been doing virtual tables because normally if you walk into MHA's office, whether it be in Newburgh or Middletown, we'd have a table of resources. So please visit our website at www.mhaorangeny.com and you'll see our virtual tables for this month. And then we're gearing up for our virtual tables for next month. And I know that the county has just released an amazing resource um, link as well. And we'll make sure that's included on our website too. And so just a final, you know, hope starts here. I remind you of the Orange County Crisis Call Center connects people in need of support for mental illness, substance use, development and disability, sexual assault, or who need information referrals with trained professionals. So as I mentioned, the 1-800-832-1200 is the number that the county exec is using for any needs that people in our community have at this point. And we look forward to continuing to serve our community. And again, shout out to all the MHA staff that are on this um, forum today. And thank you, Anaudi, for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. Really appreciate it. Um, again, the Mental Health Association's information will be on our resource list. I also want to thank um, the participants because you are giving us some really wonderful uh, resource information in the chat box, um, which we will go ahead and add to the resource list as well because it's really useful. Um, and please continue to uh, include your questions if you have any questions for our presenters. Um, so next up, we have uh, in presenting information for victims and survivors of domestic and teen dating violence. We have with us Sarita Green uh, from Fearless of the Hudson Valley. Sarita? Okay. Thank you very much for having us. Hopefully my screen share is working for all of you. Um, in the interest of time, really would like to focus our conversation around the services that we have available um, during this time. Like others, we have been unfortunately forced to um, close physical offices where we might normally meet with individuals um, in need of services. Our services remain fully open and operational, even though we're unable to, to do face-to-face -face contact during this time. Um, some folks may know that we were previously Safe Homes of Orange County in the fall of this year, um, launched a rebranding that obviously comes with a new name, but with that also an expanded mission and area of focus and really not wanting to, to be limited only to domestic violence and teen dating violence and human trafficking, but really being able to support all people and living safely um, within their homes and within their relationships, free from abuse, exploitation and oppression, recognizing that all people have the right to experience safety and support. We accomplish this mission um, through a variety of ways. We have uh, efforts that focus around prevention education as well as community outreach and education, very individualized advocacy, as well as other comprehensive services, including emergency shelter. Our services are available to all people impacted by incident um, partner violence or interpersonal violence, human trafficking, and sexual violence as well as other types of crime victimization and our service area encompasses Orange and Sullivan counties. <clears throat> the reality is that all of us are impacted um, by the current health pandemic. The hope is that by requiring social distancing, encouraging individuals to stay home, that we would all be able to maintain our own health and wellness on an individual level, but also on a larger scale, thinking about community impact as well as throughout the state, throughout the country and the world. What we know is that home is not always a safe place for all people and that isolation um, all by itself, even even under quote unquote normal circumstances can be extremely dangerous. And that unfortunately during this time for individuals who are forced into quarantine or isolation or social distancing with the very people who make their lives unsafe, um, that now more than ever, it is important that we really highlight the services that are available, that our advocates are here, are able to provide us, us assistance and support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we continue to operate our 24-hour hotline. That number is 845-562-5340. We have consolidated the two hotlines that we had previously been functioning in the two separate counties so that it's one number 
um, to be shared throughout both counties. The previous number, in case folks have seen it, is still um, live and working to ensure that there's an advocate response, but any time of day or night, individuals can call the hotline, whether they themselves are being impacted or people in their lives are being impacted that they're concerned about. We do have trained advocates available to respond to those calls and provide the necessary support. We engage individuals in a process of safety planning, recognizing that safety planning is a very individual process. There is no roadmap. There is uh, not a one size fits all plan that individuals can follow. It really involves an in-depth conversation with an advocate to support the individual in evaluating the things that may have helped to keep them safe previous to now and also plan for what their options may look like moving forward. These are just some possibilities. Um, again, it's not a one size fits all, but encouraging people to be mindful about what plan they may be able to resort for, to should things escalate or become unsafe for them or more unsafe for them in their current environment. Encouraging connection to family members, friends, individuals in their lives who are aware of what might be going on, planning with their own children around um, how they may know if things are escalating and what steps they may need to take in order to be safe in any given moment being as prepared as possible <laughs> um, and trusting one's own instincts. We absolutely in our work in safety planning with victims and survivors follow their lead, recognizing that survivors know best um, the dangerousness of their circumstances and what options will look best for them. And then obviously wanting for folks to always know and be reminded that help is available to them should they want or need it. And that can happen through our agency, whether by calling our 24-hour hotline. Um, we also encourage folks to keep in mind that not only is, is calling 911 an option, depending on the dangerousness of their circumstance, but also that texting 911 is an option. And that is true in both Orange and in Sullivan counties. A couple of weeks ago, we launched the option of um, individuals engaging with us through a free web chat option. So by visiting our website, fearlesshudsonvalley.org, for right now, sort of as a pilot between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., Monday through Friday, we have advocates who are logged in, who are available to receive text messages through this platform and are able to provide some feedback, guidance, and support to survivors who reach out in this way. Um, and so far that has um, proven to be helpful and successful in connecting with people who may be unsafe in terms of picking up a phone and making a phone call to our agency. So simply by going to our website, individuals can initiate that chat now feature. Um, our emergency shelter remains open and an option for individuals within Orange or Sullivan County who need a safe place to go um, based on no longer being able to remain in their current home environment. We have advocates available both over the telephone as well as to support in-person advocacy needs that may come up around um, accessing safety and engaging with legal systems as part of that process. We continue to work collaboratively with law enforcement agencies throughout the county, with the district attorney's office, with Child Protective Services, and the Department of Social Services around ensuring that any victims or survivors that interact with any of their systems also have access to us as an organization and to our advocates. We are continuing to um, minimize person-to-person -person contact where possible, and so some of the advocacy work may be happening over the telephone. For an example, individuals may be supporting supported in drafting an order of protection petition remotely over the phone and then meet, meet an advocate in person within the family court system in order to take care of filing and appearances as needed. We're continuing to support access to legal services, whether that's consultation and or representation through our partnership with Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. We have begun offering virtual support groups to individuals who were already connected to our work and organization, um, both group support as well as the ability to access um, therapy sessions either remotely by telephone or virtually using a video telehealth system. We continue to operate the Domestic Violence Liaison to the Department of Social Services, so every person who applies for public benefits is required 
required to be screened for the presence of domestic violence within their household and if appropriate is then referred to and connected to the domestic violence liaison. So that service is still happening um, with referrals coming through DSS and then also we're continuing to operate our emergency basic food and basic needs pantry. Individuals can access that by calling our hotline or by engaging via the web text web chat feature. Um, just as a quick reminder, again, our hotline number, we'll share that as well in the resources, reminding folks about the web chat option, and then obviously we'll answer any questions as they come, but most important, want people to be as safe and healthy as we can during this time. Thank you so much, yep. Sarita, really appreciate that. All right, wonderful. Annette, you want to take over for the next one? Yeah, so... Um... The next presenter um, is going to be, we have a, a two presenters. Um, they're going to be addressing accessing health insurance. Um, they, have, um, they, are, they have navigators in their office um, that provide assistance uh, with uh, enrolling in health insurance um, through the Affordable Care Act. Um, and they also offer other services as well. So Jenna Sweeney and Leslie Pomales Diaz, the floor is yours. Hi hey everyone, one second. All right, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me, see me? Good, okay, great. So my name is Jenna Sweeney and I am the Navigator Program Manager for MISN. On the call, we have Leslie Pomales Diaz, who is our lead navigator. So MISN is a nonprofit based in Newburgh, New York. We recently just moved to 333 Broadway and I hope um, not, um, Hopefully soon, um, we'll be able to see and meet people in our new location. We have a wonderful program space and we're really excited um, to be able to go and begin business on 333 Broadway. And so MISN uh, mostly focuses on maternal and child health services, but a big part of our work includes our navigator program. So we have 11 bilingual certified health insurance navigators that help enroll individuals and families in the New York State of Health marketplace. Um, we enroll in both the qualified health plans and in insurance affordability programs. We are doing this um, all over the phone, whereas before COVID-19, we were in five counties and about 40 different sites. We really, um, our focus was to be um, available to different neighborhoods throughout the five counties and to be accessible. Um, but now we're accessible by phone. So that for most is even easier, which is fantastic. And we're able to provide the same exact services over the phone. The state has actually made it um, much easier to streamline the process of applying for health insurance. So if you're unaware of what qualified health plans include, that would be Capital District Physicians Health Plan, Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Plus, Fidelis Care um, Health Insurance Plan of Greater New York, MVP Health Plan, United Healthcare of New York. Um, and to enroll in these programs, uh, you do have to wait for the annual open enrollment period. Um, usually that's around November to February. Um, but there are some life changes that can trigger what is called a special enrollment period. Um, so it's always good to call us to see if um, you do have that special um, life change that may uh, enable you to enroll in one of these plans. And then the insurance affordability programs, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Medicaid, Child Health Plus, and Essential Plan. Um, enrollment is open all year round if you are eligible for these plans. Um, and oops, and the marketplace will determine if you do qualify for an advanced premium tax credit or any cost sharing reductions that can lower the cost of your coverage. So call us if you do not have health insurance and you need it. If you lost your income or you've had um, a reduction in either individual or your family income, if you've had some sort of life status change if you want to see if your children will qualify for a, a plan, um, sometimes uh, you can still be enrolled um, with 
your employer's insurance. And instead of having the whole family on the insurance plan, which can be very expensive, you may qualify for your kids to um, be enrolled in a different plan through the marketplace. You can also just call us if you want a consultation to see what you're eligible for and what you're entitled to. Um, and also if you need emergency Medicaid, and I'm gonna have Leslie talk about that. Go ahead, Leslie. Hello, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Yes. So we just wanted to sort of give you a nutshell um, explanation of what emergency Medicaid actually is. There is a lot of misconception into what the word emergency means here. So a lot of people think that um, even though they're not Medicaid eligible based on income, if they have um, if something happens to them, they could just go and apply for emergency Medicaid. Usually when a person is Medicaid eligible based on income, they just get full Medicaid. So emergency Medicaid is exactly the one emergency that is covered for a person who wouldn't qualify for Medicaid or any insurance based on their document uh, for, an, for an immigration person, a person who is undocumented, who does not qualify or can't purchase any insurance because of their uh, immigration status, then they could go and apply for emergency Medicaid. If their income is eligible for Medicaid, they will give a Medicaid for the exact emergency that they had when they had to be brought to the hospital, maybe done a surgery, and maybe a follow-up visit if that applies. So if a person, for example, has um, an appendix removed, then a week, two weeks later, they have to come back to the hospital just to make sure that, that uh, the suture is closing properly and not getting any infections. So it will cover that. But it's not actual insurance. So that's why we wanted to make sure that people understand so that they are applying and they are okay in understanding what they're getting. Thank you, Leslie. And emergency Medicaid will cover emergency services related to COVID-19. So that includes diagnosis, testing, treatment. Okay. So MISN has you covered. We have extended our services to all of New York. Um, before we were limited to serving just uh, people that resided in five counties, um, but now we're servicing all New York. So if you have cousins, family, friends, New York City, Rochester, Syracuse, wherever it may be, please let them know that they can call us and we can help them. Right now we're offering same day phone appointments. Um, so we're available. We have the capacity to um, serve anyone in need and very quickly. Um, and then also navigators can help complete an application already started with New York State. So some people get into the process of going on the website, waiting on hold for a long time, um, and finally getting their application started and they run into some sort of issue. Maybe they, they don't have a copy of a particular document. Um, something may happen where they kind of get halted. Um, you can also call us and we can actually take that um, application already in our dashboard in the virtual world and put it on to one of our navigators caseload and we can finish the application. Um, we are open for appointments Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5 p.m. You can call me. I'm scheduling all the appointments. Um, Leslie is too, if, um, if you um, Spanish only. Um, so you can call me at 845-248-3942. And Leslie is 845-238-9685. And our services are always free. A few other services that uh, we are offering currently. So every Tuesday from 1030 to 1230, we have a virtual breastfeeding support group. Uh, you can call Stephanie to get the meeting details for that. Her number is 845-492-9027. Or you could always call um, our 800 number that's listed on our website at www.misn.ny.org. Um, all of our numbers are listed on the, I believe it's the About Us page. Um, continuing on with our youth services, we have a brand new Facebook page, so please visit and share it. It's called All About You Facebook. 
Um, it's a place for uh, youth to connect with our um, youth services staff. Uh, there will be a virtual youth group every Thursday. I believe the first one was last Thursday at 3 p.m., which is an extension of MISN's after school program. And then also coming soon is an Empowered Girls Summit planning team. Um, so for anything related to youth services, you can reach out to Ramona Burton and her number is, I actually can't see it because it's behind, oops. Um, her number is listed there, but her email is rburton at misn-ny.org. Um, we're also posting all the time on our Instagram. You can follow us there at misn underscore ny underscore org. And that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks. Thank you, Jenna. Um, our next presenter is Liz Constantino. Liz is uh, the coordinator for the Family Planning Benefits Program for Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. And she's going to talk to you about the Family Planning Benefits Program um, and some other services that, uh, that we offer. Liz? Hi, everyone. I'm just going to pull out my screen. Can everybody see it? Yes? Okay, cool. Okay, so again, as Annette said, my name is Liz Costantino, and I am the Regional Family Planning Benefit Program Coordinator um, for Long Island and New York City, and I'm doing some work in your region as well. Um, so I'm going to just give you an update about the, the services that Planned Parenthood is providing um, during this public health care crisis. Um, so, and it's around the health centers that are available to your clients. And I'll also um, give you an update about the Family Planning Benefit Program. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Planned Parenthood um, provides comprehensive access to reproductive health for all individuals of all ages. Uh, hold on. Okay. Um, so the health centers that are open in the Mid Hudson Valley are Newburgh and Poughkeepsie. Um, so I'm not really familiar with the area and I don't know like the distance between the two, but I've also included their addresses. Um, and I believe their hours are 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday or Saturday. Um, and all patients are being screened as they come into the health centers um, for health-related illnesses and their temperatures are being taken. And the health center staff are keeping an eye out on um, individuals sitting together in large groups. Um, so, there's different ways that an individual can make an appointment. Um, Planned Parenthood of Greater New York has implemented telehealth and te telephonic modalities for visits. Um, so an individual can download the PP Direct app. Um, and this is for individuals who are 14 or older and they can make an appointment and have a virtual visit that way. They can also call 1-800-230-PLAN um, and they can have a virtual visit set up that way um, or they can make their appointments online. So we are providing most of our services either in person or remotely. So the remote services are going to be um, birth control care and refills, um, emergency contraception, preventive care services, trans non-binary non hormone therapy refills, and the health centers are also offering in-person care, so STI screening for those who are symptomatic and treatment, IUD insertion and removal, um, urgent care as it relates to reproductive health, and medical, in, at medical and in-clinic abortion care and follow-up. So also, this, well, let me go back for a second. Also, the services that are provided are access to health insurance. Um, the, there's enrollers within each health center that can provide um, 
assistance with marketplace enrollments through New the New York State of Health. Um, they also provide enrollment to Medicaid for pregnant individuals and the Family Planning Benefit Program. So the program that I primarily work with is the Family Planning Benefit Program. I'm just gonna share some information if you've never heard of it before um, and how an, an individual would access the application process. Um, so basically it's an insurance plan, it's a form of Medicaid. Um, it's very unique in that it offers free and confidential care and services. So an individual can apply if they are either uninsured, underinsured, or in need of confidential care. So confidentiality in terms of an individual who has a third party health insurance or a primary health insurance through a, a parent or a spouse or a guardian, they could apply for this program and the two insurances will never intersect. So the individual can use the family planning benefit program for their birth control and reproductive health. Um, so going into what are the covered services, um, off the bat, it's always birth control and preventive care. And with that, it will cover um, preventive annual exams, pap smears, um, breast exams, STI screening and treatment. Um, it will cover HIV testing, really anything related to pregnancy prevention. Um, and it doesn't cover, it doesn't cover um, mammograms, it doesn't cover um, prenatal care, abortion, or HIV preventative care. Um, there are some eligibility requirements for an individual to enroll. So they must be a New York State resident, um, have a US citizenship or satisfactory immigration status. Um, their income must be under 223% of the federal poverty level. So what that looks like in layman's terms is about 28,000 a year for one single person. The individual can include others in their household that they're that they're um, that tax dependent individuals and the income cap will increase. So they just they must not be already enrolled in a Medicaid plan because this is a form of Medicaid and they'll be able to access um, confidential reproductive health care through their current um, Medicaid plan if they have that. Um, they can apply if they're enrolled in a primary health insurance through a parent or a spouse or guardian or um, Child Health Plus. And application assistance can be um, provided at family planning agencies, including Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, and both the Poughkeepsie and the Newburgh centers in your region um, do provide that care. Um, and that is it for me. Uh, I know we're saving questions until the end, so if you have any questions, let us know. Liz, before you finish, can you talk a little bit about the presumptive eligibility for Family Planning Benefits Program? Did you sure, so right now, um, there's two ways to access the program um, through presumptive eligibility and ongoing coverage. So what presumptive eligibility is, it's a temporary, it's temporary coverage. So an individual can be screened and they do not have to provide any documents. They can self attest um, to their eligibility and they'll be able to get care for up to, up to 60 days. So depending on the day they were screened. Now that we're going through to telehealth or telephonic modalities, um, the New York State of Health has actually eased documentation. So an individual, if they are being enrolled through a screen, um, they won't necessarily have to provide their documentation. Um, we're waiting on an actual directive from the New York State of Health. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, the um, New York State Department of Health, um, and that should be coming out shortly. So we are, I work al closely alongside them. So it's a great program. It's, it's um, easy to apply. And with COVID, they are like loosening the guidelines a bit. But thank you for asking that question, Annette. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Howdy. Okay, let me 
Stop sharing. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much to all of the presenters. Um, we do have a couple of questions that we want to uh, include and in the interest of time, we've got a few questions that we want to kind of highlight. Um, but again, as a reminder, these resources and contact information for our presenters will be on our resource list. Um, so the first question that came in um, for Michelle or for Melanie, um, folks want to know how can the general population, how can anyone volunteer to help deliver food? If somebody's answering that, you're on mute. Hi. Uh, so volunteers that are interested in helping can uh, call the same phone number that we use for uh, folks that are interested in receiving a box. And you can just leave a message and let us know that you're interested in volunteering. And then you can always reach out to myself or Michelle as well. Um, and we'll put our information up uh, in the chat so everybody has that also. Perfect. Thank you. Another question um, that came in is, uh, and this question was asked a couple of times, so I think it's referring to different services. Um, what services are available for autistic individuals? Um, and I believe that question was asked in specific to your uh, different, I don't know by you, I don't know who was, whose it was, it was asked a couple of times. Um, are there, does any, any one of the presenters want to address the question, uh, services for autistic individuals? And actually, just real quick, um, so Wendy from Independent Living did add in that there are services through Independent Living, um, so they will be able to reach those. But does anybody, any of the presenter want to add anything around services to autistic individuals? Okay. So we are going to, again, in the chat, Independent Living um, chimed in. Thank you, Wendy, for that. Um, Sarita, there was a question and some concerns around um, translating for clients and Spanish-speaking uh, services. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? And I'm actually messaging on the side with um, the person mm -hmm. where the question came from. So just want to clarify that all of our services are accessible for anyone, regardless of the language they speak. Um, at this point, almost half of our, our hotline advocates are bilingual in English and Spanish. And we also have staff who speak a variety of other languages and then do have access to the language line to support translation if we don't have a staff member who speaks that language and do have the technology set up to support connecting whether to a different advocate um, within our agency or connecting, connecting to the language line. So hopefully for, that isn't a barrier for anyone, but I did put my contact information into the chat box in case that comes up so we can work it through. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Um, a couple of other questions that we have. Um, one is around accessibility to programs and resources that have been mentioned. Um, for example, if a person is undocumented, can they still access your resources? Um, so if anybody wants to chime in, if that is a challenge for them, or if, that's, if services are still available um, for people who are undocumented. Hi, this is Liz. Um... So in regards to the family planning benefit program, an individual has to be a U.S. citizen or have satisfactory immigration status. Um, but in terms of Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, they don't have to be a citizen um, to access services. Um, they don't have to have insurance. They can, we can place them on our sliding fee scale and assess them according to their income. Thank you. I, I would, also, um, oh, go ahead, Sarita. Sorry, I just wanted to add to that that documentation status is not an mm -hmm. issue or a barrier for our agency either. In fact, we don't ask at all. It's not, um, not at all part of the criteria unless people are interested in some immigration re related support. And then obviously it makes sense to know and explore that further, um, but not an issue on our end at all. Perfect, thank you. And um, to piggyback that, uh, the Mental Health Association and also for food services through uh, neighbors collectively feeding each other. Collectively <laughs> helping our neighbors. Thank you, thank you. Um, the same answer applied and they also do not, do not ask for documentation or, or status. 
Um, another question is, um, what happens if I don't have access to transportation? How can I get food donation for myself or my family? So and do I need to show ID? So for collectively helping our neighbors, we actually deliver the food in order to make sure that we are um, trying to flatten the curve and dec decrease exposure. Um, and we do not ask for ID, anything like that. Wonderful. Um, and MHA also chimed in with a response um, regarding individuals with autism. Uh, they also do provide services um, for individuals with autism and their information is on there as well. Just looking through the questions here. Okay, so that looks like uh, the majority of questions. Um, again, I just want to, and uh, Judy, if you can cue that uh, final slide. I want to once again, thank all of our presenters for taking the time to go over um, the presentations. There is feedback in the chat box um, that said how grateful people were and what great job everyone did. So thank you. This information was really, really wonderful. I also want to thank all of our community partners that sent staff or you know here representing um, our community. I saw a lot of different um, communities and agencies represented. So thank you so much for participating. Um, for those resources that we mentioned and promised, you can go to the orangecountygov.com website backslash, uh, backslash human rights and you will find our resources. Um, and also keep in mind, this is a three part series. Uh, part two is tomorrow. It will be all in Spanish. So please send anyone our way who could use this information. And then part three is on May 4th and that will be the continuation of the conversation including um, financial assistance. We will have cent uh, Central Hudson on the line. We will also have legal services of the Hudson Valley discussing uh, housing rights. So another really wonderful conversation. Um, and also again, thank you so much for my partners with the uh, Newburgh Healthy uh, Latinx and Black Coalition. Thank you so much for Judy and Annette for you know taking care of the Zoom information uh, and Lana as well. Um, so thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon and you all have our contact information. Feel free to stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Anadi. You're so welcome. I'll talk to you later.